Mirror World was not in a good place. Almost all of the design work I had done so far was focused on trying to make the Shadow Lords and Seals work, and realizing that these concepts were actively undermining the flavor of the game meant that getting things back on track would mean restarting almost from the beginning. With such a monumental choice facing the game's future, I procrastinated. There was this other interesting idea I'd been toying around with, so why not flesh out the rules for that and give it a test run? This game was designed as a battle between good and evil. Each player had a deck which included 20 good cards and 20 evil cards, although all of the cards had both a good and evil ability. In a turn, players would start by setting one card face down, and then they would take turns back and forth to play one card onto their field until each player had three face-up cards in play. Then the face down card would be revealed, and you would reveal rather you were acting as good or evil during this turn. Players wouldn't know which sets of abilities the opponent would be activating for the current turn, so during the shared turn structure they would have to develop their board while figuring out if the opponent was planning on taking an evil turn or taking a good turn, and you'd have to react against that as best you can as the board develops. While this was an interesting concept, it didn't really have the design space that would make it work as a TCG. However, it did have some interesting applications back over in Mirror World. As it turns out, spending a bunch of time working away from Shadow Lords and Seals finally gave me some ideas on how to drag the game back on course to its core flavor. The first big idea I was interested in porting over from the Good and Evil game was the shared turn structure. For a while, I had noticed that the technologically advanced modern city aspect of the setting wasn't really being captured in the game's mechanics all that well. I had had vague notions in the past of introducing locations to the field and having the game play out a bit more like a worker placement board game, but I really had no idea on how to practically make this work in a trading card game. The shared turn structure I tried in the Good and Evil game finally gave me a workable idea to try and make a location-based system work, so I decided to go and run with that. After quickly rebuilding the rules around a shared turn structure using locations, I ended up with rules revision number 6. At the start of the turn, each player draws one card from their deck. Beginning with the active player for the turn, each player could then play up to two new units from their hand into a standby zone. Shadows can also be set to fronts in the standby zone at this time as well. Next, players allocate all their cards in standby to one of three locations. Each player can send a maximum of three units to each location. And this is the obligatory main phase where players, again beginning with the active player, can activate their unit abilities and attack. Attacking is targeted, but you can only target opposing units that are in the same location as the attacker. Finally, each front unit at a location will provide a location-specific effect and then return back to standby, ready to be sent out again next turn. Fronts at the library draw you a card, fronts at the office tower draw you a resource, and fronts at the temple are flipped face down and converted to damage. The first to accumulate 7 damage onto their opponent will win. In a nod to the previous versions of the game, cards that were flipped face down to become damage were called seals. Finally, since only fronts could activate locations, I added a starting front card to begin in players' hands to ensure they'd be able to get the ball rolling in the early game and wouldn't get screwed out of the game by drawing a handful of only shadows. This location system was the drastic shakeup that the game needed. Most importantly though, it kept the core idea of the game, but it finally gave me a functional alternative to Shadow Lords and Seals. These mechanics had never been central to the concept, but in all of the previous rules revisions, I'd kept trying to make them work without really exploring alternatives outside of them. From the very first playtest of this new system, the locations were already vastly better at capturing the city flavor of the setting, and it really gave the game a unique flavor outside of the usual generic battlefields of most other TCGs. All this is not to say that this new rule system was free of problems. In fact, there were quite a few of them in this first take on a location system. The starting front initially had no abilities, which both made it boring since they were all the same, but it was also vulnerable to, to opposing attacks which made it a little too easy for the opponent to destroy all of your fronts and then lock you out of the game. To fix the vulnerability to attacks, I made the starting front untargetable and indestructible. To make it a bit more interesting, without interfering in the function as a reliable and consistent front for the early game, 
I brought the Shadow Lord back in, this time on the back of your starting front card. I really only did this to spice up the starting front card a bit, but as I tested the concept, I realized it coincidentally also fixed almost every issue I had had with Shadow Lords in previous versions of the game. It was no longer tied to your life system at all, which meant that the goal was not to defeat it anymore. In fact, with the Shadow Lords near immortal targeting protections, even if the player was defeated, the Shadow Lord would still be sitting there comfortably on the field. The Shadow Lords had always been flavored as immortal beings that couldn't be killed, only sealed away, and almost completely by accident, I had stumbled onto a gameplay implementation that finally matched this concept. The next issue was actually several smaller issues all kind of bundled together, and their solution was all bundled in as well. For one, there was a location imbalance. The temple was by far the most important location, and the office tower was often irrelevant. After sending a few units to the library to draw you a few extra cards to hand, the rest of the game would be generally spent shoving the maximum number of your units into the temple until you won. Because you only had so many units, it was often correct to completely ignore the office tower, and if you were ignoring the office tower, you could also just not put any cards with resource costs into your deck at all. Second issue here was field permanence. Your units at the temple would essentially be sacrificed for damage, which didn't feel all that great. Compounding this, your units at other locations would leave those locations and return to your standby at the end of each turn. Both of these were creating issues with a lack of field permanence. Basically, it didn't really feel like you were building up to anything over the course of the game. And finally, there was an issue with costs. Shadows had no real costs outside of the basic ability costs, which was still limiting the range of effects and power stats I could use on them. Additionally, at this time, reversing was done by just paying one resource, which was kind of boring and really not all that engaging. This batch of problems was fixed by a batch of solutions, mostly centered around changing the life system and then likewise retooling the temple location. I had been considering using a life deck for a while, where players lose once they run out of cards to draw. This was really the last of the three main life system options, and I had been resisting it for a while. But the game didn't really want to use an abstract number total, since that's what the resource system had been using for most of the design process, and also I find the abstract number life total to be a little bit boring. The game also didn't really want to use cards to represent life in a shield system, since the field of play already had a lot going on and adding even more complexity there was just going to completely overwhelm the play space. I generally don't like deck systems, mostly because of how much counting has to be done whenever somebody wants an update on the current life totals. Here, I guess the lesson was, don't knock it until you try it. In this case, the concept actually worked quite well. It also was coincidentally a huge flavor win, since milling in Magic the Gathering was often associated with sanity loss, which is very thematically appropriate in a game about eldritch beings. To go along with this, the temple was retooled to reverse your units rather than deal damage, and shadows were given a manifest rank of either 1 or 2. To reverse a unit now, you had to tap fronts at the temple equal to the manifest rank of the shadow. Then, when the shadow attacked, it would discard cards from the top of your opponent's deck equal to the manifest rank. This was somewhat similar to how Soul works in Wise Schwartz. All of these changes brought me up to Rules 6b. At this point, there was still the problem with field permanence. Your units are still returning to standby at the end of each turn, which limited how much you were really able to build up a field and also just tended to be tedious, since most of the time if you weren't shoving those units into the temple, you were just redeploying them to the exact same spot they were at the previous turn. So the simple solution was to let the units stay at their locations. In the first playtest, this immediately felt better, but it led to a cascade of other rules changes that led me to Rules Revision 7, which is now the current and final version of the game. In Rules Revision 7, you can still only play out two units per turn, but your units also no longer return to the standby each turn. This meant that the back and forth allocation of units to locations took a lot less time, and more and more of the action was being spent in the main phase, where players were able to activate their effects and attack. In this phase specifically, who could act first was vitally important, and since the rest of the shared turn was becoming less and less important, the whole shared turn concept had largely outlived its usefulness. So I moved back to a more standard individual turn structure, and it was a surprisingly small adjustment. In fact, I had just printed the first proper batch of test cards for Rule 6b, with a shared turn, and moving to Rule 7 required errata for only a single one of these cards. 
This was the last major evolution of the game's rules, but there were several other changes that came along, and I'll run through each of them briefly. Originally, players drew a card to start their turn. One issue early in Rules Revision 6 was that it was often correct to ignore the office tower completely and build a deck with no resource costs at all. So, to encourage a basic level of resource use, I had players start their turn by drawing a card and then charging a resource. But this led to another problem where it would feel really bad if you charged the wrong card. For example, if you really needed to draw a front, but you drew a shadow and then immediately charged a front from the top of your deck to your resources, that was not a great feeling. So to fix this, I had players look at the top two cards of their deck and then charge one and draw the other. I briefly experimented with going even further with a Wicross style draw to then charge any card from your hand, but since the game didn't have a level system as rigid as Wicross's, there was a lot more of decision processing here, and I found that overall the check two and then draw one, charge one was the right fit in this circumstance. In Rule 6, I started with the abstract number consumable resource system I had in previous versions of the game, and then quickly moved into using cards from your deck set into a resource zone that you could then discard to use your abilities. As an evolution to this, I then tried having them move to standby after being used, and both of these implementations were causing problems. Discarding meant that the cost was really high to use in abilities, meaning that abilities had to be stupidly impactful for their cost, and really limiting the overall effectiveness of a resource system. Moving them to standby, on the other hand, did make the cost a little bit more lenient, but it led to all kinds of rules weirdness with shadow units, and it also felt a little bit too similar to the more traditional card advantage provided by the library. I eventually settled with putting the resources onto the bottom of the deck after use, which took a little bit of adjustment since the instinct was just to immediately send them to trash, but it did end up working out really well. Using resources now wasn't causing functional life loss, and in fact it encouraged players to include cards with resource costs into their deck. Locations originally triggered at the end of the turn. When the temple was retooled from a damaged location to a reversing location, it worked by tapping your units at that location. Given that this worked out quite well, I quickly moved all other locations to use this system as well, and it was just working a lot better. It felt better to deliberately tap your units to get an effect rather than just statically performing an action when your turn ended, but it also fixed the problem that the library and the office tower were actually really bad in the late game, since they were involuntarily pulling cards out of your deck if you had any fronts left there at all. The Shadow Lord was the final major problem to resolve. After several test games, I was beginning to discover the optimal play pattern, and it wasn't much fun. You would deploy your starting front to the temple. The Shadow Lord on the back was rank 3, so you needed the maximum number of other fronts there, which could be accomplished reliably on turn 2. From there, you would flip your Shadow Lord and then consistently attack at the temple every turn. When players shared their turn, this would often lock the slower player out of flipping their own Shadow Lord entirely, or at worst, cause so much tempo loss that it would be almost impossible to get back into the game even if they did flip their Shadow Lord later. Moving back to individual turns, the first Shadow Lord to flip an attack would still drastically reduce the opponent's ability to reverse their own Lord, and still cause a ton of tempo loss. The only way to have a fighting chance against this was to play your own starting front to the temple, essentially making turn 1 send the starting front to the temple a compelled move. The solution here was to have the Shadow Lord flip back to its front after each attack. It was also changed so that it was unaffected by the temple it could only flip with its own ability. This drastically cut back on how much it interfered with the natural game pattern, while also making it a lot less reliant on sending units to the temple in order to flip it. One final late revision was to allow fronts to be placed below fronts. As anyone who has played with morphs in Magic the Gathering or Infinities in Yu-Gi-Oh! will know, it can be an easy cheat to stick a card face down when needed, and just hope that the opponent doesn't check after the match. Given how heavily this game was using face down cards, this could make for a pretty tedious end of game task. So now, if a front is attacked and there's another front face down in the unit, they are just both destroyed. Since fronts can't reverse to fronts, there's no real benefit to putting a front below another front, but adding this rule simply cleaned up a loophole, and who knows, at some point it might open up some design space later on in the future. So, overall, this is the game in its final form. To get a sense as to how everything came together, for the rest of this video, I will walk through a brief sample game. 
To start out a game of Mirror World, you take the three location cards and place them between the two players onto the field. Then you take the starting front out of your deck, place it into your standby zone. Then you shuffle your deck and draw three cards. From there, we move into the first turn. Now, the first phase of the turn is the Dawn phase. That's when you take the top two cards of your deck, and you get to add one of them to hand and the other to standby. However, because we are going first here as the first turn player, we skip that move on our very first turn. Instead, we'll move straight into our arrival phase. That's when we can place any of the units from our hand into our standby. So we're going to place out one front to our standby, and since the standby has a maximum of two units, that's all that we can place in there for now. One thing we can do, though, is since one of our units as the starting front does have a shadow on the back, so we can't put anything underneath there, but for all of our other units, we can place one card from our hand face down underneath it. Now that we have our units in our standby, we move into the departure phase where we are able to allocate these units in standby to different locations. Each location will give you a different ability. We're going to go ahead and put both of our units at the library. The library's ability allows you to tap the unit to draw a card. So we'll tap our two units and then draw one and two cards. And then we'll pass the turn over to the opponent. Now, since the opponent is not on the first turn player's first turn, they are going to take their dawn phase. They're going to check the top two cards of their deck. They're going to add one to their standby and add the other to their hand. Now they're going to play out some units. To start with, they're going to play out Director of Human Resources. This is a front with the appear ability to take one of your units from standby and place it to the office tower location. Then they will place a shadow underneath the front in their standby, and then they're going to move the units in their standby to different locations. To start with, they're going to move their starting front to the temple. However, you only need three units there, and since they're going to be able to play out two fronts from their hand next turn, and their Shadow Lord here is not going to be able to be defeated by an opposing attack, they don't need to put anything out there right now, so they can get a little bit of card advantage for free over here and place it at the library. They're going to go ahead and draw one card. And now since they have a unit at the office tower, they're going to tap that. And that just takes the top card of the deck and it puts it into your resources. Now they could use their ability at the temple to flip one of their units face up uh, to its shadow form, but they're not going to go ahead and do that. They'd much rather leave it as a surprise for the opponent to attack into. So the unit at the temple isn't going to be doing anything. It'll just be getting ready for the next turn. Uh, from there, that is the end of the turn and it'll pass back over to us. We start by untapping our units and we check the top two cards of our deck. Uh, we currently have a hand full of front cards and the top two cards of our deck are one shadow and one front. We'll go ahead and put the front over here and add the shadow to our hand. Next up, we're going to play out a pair of anarchists as our fronts. And we unfortunately have one shadow, so that's going to go underneath one of the anarchists. We'll send both of these anarchists over to the temple, and we'll go ahead and use the two units at the library in order to draw two more cards, just to make sure we have a nice and full hand for the next few turns. Our plan on the next turn is to start moving our units into the temple and start flipping some of our other units so we can actually start attacking properly. Once again, back over to the opponent, they are untapping, checking two, charging one and drawing the other. They will play out one fair attendant and a leveraged banker. A leveraged banker has an appear effect that allows you to trash one card in your resources to charge two cards from the top of your deck to your resources. From there, we're gonna shove both of these units to our temple location, and we're going to start moving in a bit more of an aggressive direction. First up, since we have three units at the temple, we can activate the ability of our starting front. We just simply tap it, and it flips itself over to its Shadow Lord side. Next up, we're not quite sure what our opponent is hiding under here, but 
On their turn, their Revolutionary Flag Bearer Front gives it plus 2,000 power as a memory ability. So, in order to try and get ahead of that a little bit, we're going to use one of our fronts at the temple to reverse our front at the library. So, it flips over to its shadow form. In this case, it's Risen Warrior, a one Manifest Rank 1 shadow with 7,000 power. Manifest Rank 1 means we only need to tap one unit to reverse it, and it'll deal one damage to the opponent on an attack. So, let's move into attacks and see how that works. So the Risen Warrior is going to attack at this location, targeting the Revolutionary Flag Bearer. When you attack, the first thing you do is deal damage to your opponent equal to the Manifest Rank of the attacker. In this case, the damage is going to be 1 since the Manifest Rank is also 1. When you take damage, you simply flip that many cards from the top of your deck into your graveyard. The next step of the attack is if you're attacking a front that has a card underneath it, you turn that card face up if it's face down, and then it is flipped over into the attack target. In this case, this is Ineffable Messenger, which only has 6,000 power. Uh, you compare the power of the attacker and the defender. If the attacker has more power than the defender, the defender is destroyed. However, if the defender's power is equal or above the attacker's power, then nothing happens. The attack simply fails, although you did manage to get in for a little bit of damage. In this case, however, we managed to exceed the power of our opponent's defender, so we destroy their unit and we still get the damage. So that was a very productive turn on this side, and we can still use our leveraged banker sitting over here unbothered in the office tower to charge one more resource from the top of our deck. Moving back over to our turn, we are going to untap, check two, charge one, draw one. Play out two units from our hand. Priest of Glad Tidings has an appear ability where we can pay one to put two cards from our graveyard on the bottom of our deck, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, to pay out a cost, you pay that many cards from your resources to the bottom of your deck. In this case, we paid the cost of one, so we get to take two cards from our graveyard and put them on the bottom of the deck. And because your deck acts like your life total, this is functionally life gain. Next, we'll place two cards underneath our two units, and we're going to move them to their locations. The priest is going to move to the temple, and the flag bearer is going to move over here to the office tower. Now, the flag bearer isn't actually all that interested in using the ability of the office tower, but our opponent has a front without anything underneath it, so it's easy pickings for an attack. So, we're going to go ahead and tap two of our units at the temple in order to flip this manifest rank 2 shadow. This is Bloodwinged Reaper. It has the Emerge ability that takes one card from our graveyard and places it underneath the unit. So it now has two fronts beneath it. When it flips, it can choose either one to flip back to. Appear abilities trigger when you place cards from your hand into your standby, and Emerge abilities trigger when a face-down shadow is turned face up. Uh, they're both slightly different variants of on-play effects. So since we have a powerful attacking unit here, getting a 4,000 point buff, 2,000 from each of the Revolutionary Flag Bearers, we're going to move into an attack of our own here. Now, notably, this is one of the stronger attackers from this deck, and it kind of showcases the red-blight strategy that is currently in the game, and that's to do with memory. Memory is an ability that is on front cards that transfers abilities onto the shadow. So in this case, the memory ability gives the shadow plus 2,000 power, bringing the total power over here to 11,000. So even if the opponent did have something over here that we wanted to get rid of, uh, we'd be able to easily overtake it. Furthermore, since we don't need all of that power on this attack, we're going to make use of it in a different way. Bloodwinged Reaper lets us, once per turn, discard one card from underneath it in order to increase its manifest rank by one. So, it's already flipped, so it doesn't really count there, but when we attack, that means we're dealing 3 damage instead of only 2. And since this is a mere front with no shadow behind it to speak of, it is easily destroyed and sent to the graveyard. From there, since we also have 3 units at the front, we're going to go ahead and reverse our own Shadow Lord over here at the library. Furthermore, since we have no other units at the library besides the Shadow Lord, the opponent actually can't attack, since they can't target the Shadow Lord with an attack because of its absolute barrier ability, 
But there's also no other units to attack here, and they can't just ignore the units that are there and attack directly, so they're not able to attack at this location at all, so we've very effectively blocked this area from taking any more damage. Now back over to the opponent's turn, they will untap. Check two. Charge one, draw one. They're going to play their Navigation Assistant. This has an Appear effect that allows them to pay out one in order to place one of their units at one location over to another location. So they'll play out this unit, moving it to the bottom of their deck to move this unit over to the office tower. It's not quite in a great position over here either, since they're both 7,000 power, but at the very least it's going to be able to attack and deal a little bit of damage. Now the opponent has more cards in their hand, but they're not particularly useful at this point in the game, so they're just going to stick with this one here. They're going to move it over to the office tower. They all tap it to gain one more resource back. They'll attack over here. Uh, since they have equal power, neither are destroyed. However, you do still get in for one damage to the opponent's life. Then we'll attack with our Shadow Lord. The Shadow Lord, when this one attacks, you get to take one card from your graveyard and add it to your resources. So we'll stack that up over there. And then you get an Hourglass token. This will be useful for the second part of the ability. Uh, since the next time we flip it over, if we have an Hourglass token, we can pay four to untap all of our other units. Uh, for now, though, it's simply an attack going through, and we'll target this unit right here. Now, we could attack this and guarantee our attack, but the Shadow Lord has an extremely high power value, so it's likely going to be able to defeat anything on the opponent's side they can throw at us. So we'll try and take down a slightly more threatening card. To start with, the Shadow Lord has a power of 3, which means it deals 3 damage immediately. Then the attack will flip over the unit. This is Spectre Among Lost Souls, which is only 6,000 power, so it is easily defeated. The final part of this attack is that after the Shadow Lord attacks, it turns itself back face down, so you need to spend another turn flipping it around in order to continue attacking with it. Jumping back over here, we will untap, check two, charge one, draw one. We're going to go ahead and play another Priest of Glad Tidings, paying out one in order to put two cards from our graveyard onto the bottom of our deck. We are actually not going to deploy the priest anywhere. Uh, for now, we're just going to keep him back here in case we draw a shadow on our next turn and we want somewhere to put it. Shadows can't enter play into the standby on their own. They can only come into play underneath another front. So, since this is the only card we have in our hand at the moment, we're just going to let it chill in the standby and hope we draw something interesting over the next turn. To start with, we are going to attack with our Shadow Lord over here. Now, it has a base power of 3, but since it's attacking and there's no defenders over at this location, it gets a plus 1 damage boost. So in this case, it's going to be dealing 4 damage. Additionally, this has the on attack trigger, which lets us take 3 cards from our graveyard. And move them to the bottom of our deck, and then we draw 1 card. Then, of course, it flips back to its front side. Next up, we will discard another card off of our Bloodwinged Reaper in order to give it the Manifest Rank plus one bonus, and we will attack over here uh, for three damage. And this is only a front, so it's easily destroyed. Now we still have a little bit of action left to do, so at the temple we are going to reverse our priest into Spectre Among Lost Souls. This takes one of our fronts from our graveyard, adds it to the unit, and then we can discard one of the fronts attached to Spectre in order to draw a card and give it plus 2,000 power this turn. So we draw one. 
give it 8,000 power, boosted to 2,000 because it's got the Flag Bearer giving it a memory ability, and will attack for 10,000 against a front that's not particularly adept at defending itself. However, we do still get in for an additional point of damage. So, one damage, and this front is destroyed. Also, at the end of the turn, since this shadow has no fronts underneath it, it is actually discarded. Shadows without a front do not remain on the field and are instead sent to the graveyard at the end of the turn. Moving over here, our board is not looking all that great, but hopefully we can pull together a decent comeback turn. We're going to check two, charge one, draw one. So to attempt to mount our counterattack, we are going to play out two units here, and we're going to put a shadow underneath one of them. The unit with the shadow, we will move over here, and the unit without the shadow will move to the temple. Our banker and planner at the temple are going to both use their abilities to use the temple to flip over Fallen Prophet. Fallen Prophet on Emerge lets you take one card from your graveyard and add it to your hand. We'll go ahead and add another Fallen Prophet. Then we'll go ahead, attack with Fallen Prophet. This deals three damage since there's nothing defending this location. Then we'll attack here. This deals two damage again since there's no defenders. Next, since we have three units at the temple, We'll go ahead and tap our starting front, reverse it to its Shadow Lord form, and now, since we have four resources and an Hourglass token, we can spend the token, and those four resources, sending them to the bottom of the deck, in order to untap all of our other units. So, over here, we're just going to attack for 2 and 3 for another 5 damage over here. So that was a lot of damage bursting out all at once there, but it's moving back to our turn, so hopefully we can make something of that and counterattack back. Our opponent is getting low on life as well. So we will check 2, charge 1, add 1 to hand, we're going to go ahead and play out Rogue Hacker into our second standby slot. Uh, Rogue Hacker, on a peer, both players draw one card and then discard one card from their hand. Since I got rid of a card out of both of our decks, that is essentially dealing damage, although it does give a little bit of card selection as well. Fortunately, that also helped us make sure that we have a shadow for each of these units, so we can equip those there move into our departure phase, moving these over here and over here. Uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and tap and reverse our Shadow Lord. Next, we will snipe down one of our opponent's fronts with our Specter, dealing one damage. And we will use the ability of the temple to reverse our priest into the ineffable messenger. Now we'll go to attack, dealing two damage since there's no defender, and ineffable messenger has an ability which lets us pay one in order to draw a card. Now normally drawing a card this late in the game is not great, but since it's putting a resource back, it's actually neutral to life, so it's actually not that bad. So we'll untap, untap, check two, charge one, draw one. The opponent was nearly defeated, but they still have one life left here, which is all that they really need. They will play out a front, play out a unit beneath that front, move the front to the temple, because why not? Then they will attack with their warden, charging a resource from their graveyard. And dealing three damage, they will attack and target to destroy the Spectre. So that is three damage, and the Spectre is now destroyed. 
And to finish things off, this unit flips back to its front, but that's not really necessary. Uh, because we've got one, two, three, four, five more damage over at the office tower that the opponent, once again, has neglected to defend. So, one, two, damage here, and then one, two, and three. So we have now run out of cards, which means that the game is now over. And overall, that's Mirror World in a nutshell. There is still definitely some tweaking and adjusting to do with the game. Uh, you may have noticed one thing is that the Shadow Lord's printed versions has a manifest rank of 4, whereas in the game the damage displayed was only 3. There is going to be a ton of tweaks like that in the future just for power balance and overall game flow, but the core rules are in a spot that I'm really, really happy with. At the start of this whole design journey, I began with the simple question, are the essential elements actually a useful tool for game design? At the end of this design journey for Mirror World, I have to say that they are useful up to a point. They were very useful in troubleshooting and finding out exactly where your game has started to go wrong. For example, when there were problems in the life system or the resource system, not only was I able to pinpoint the system that was causing problems, but by knowing the essential elements and what each of those systems were trying to do in the overall image of the game, I was able to figure out why they were going wrong and identify the problem and hopefully identify a solution much more quickly. Beyond that though, starting the game with a checklist of elements to try and build towards is not a great way to start out the game design process, and overall I found that most of my best ideas were spent when I wasn't particularly focused on the minutia of the essential elements. That being said, the essential elements were still a useful tool to show me when I was on track, and help me when I was getting off track. Really though, the main reason I really wanted to do this journey through a full design process, from conception all the way up to the base rules being completed, was to really show just how messy game design can really be. You're going to be taking a ton of steps forward, and then also a ton of steps back. There are going to be times when you have to throw out a huge amount of the work you've already done, and start from what feels like almost from scratch. However, the real secret to game design is persistence, and at the end of it all, despite having to throw away a huge amount of the work I've done over the previous videos in order to make the final version work, I do believe that Mirror World ended up in a really great place, and it's a game that I'm really happy with. Best of luck in your own design journeys as you work through the treacherous path ahead, and have a fantastic day.